Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we bring you day 286 of Russian invasion into Ukraine. As usual, with Alexei Rostovich, advisor to the office of the President of Ukraine, Lieutenant Colonel, and Mark Fagan, Russian opposition politician. Today they discuss situation on the front, Russia running out of their strategic missile stockpile, having wasted most of them on useless attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure, the effectivity of German jeopards, Cognitions of the West that uh, very likely there will not be negotiations with Russia. Everything will be decided first on the battlefront. Zelensky's visit to see his troops on the front line and Putin being afraid to do that. Hungary's attempts to block aid to Ukraine and even pro-Russian propagandists acknowledging that nobody knows on the front, on the Russian front, what are they fighting for. And they will touch upon the scandal with TV rain. Enjoy. Dear friends, glad to see you all on Fagin Live. It is Tuesday, December 6th, and time is 10 p.m. Kiev, 11 p.m. Moscow. Day 286 with Alexei Rostovich. Good evening. Oop, uh, sorry guys, we have an issue with the sound here. I don't know, I can hear you well. Hang on one moment, I apologize. There is an echo. One moment, friends. Everything happens. Um, so what? Hang on. Resolving an issue with the sound here. Okay, I think we're getting there. Can you hear me now, Alexei? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Okay, okay, good. We had a minor issue with sound here. I apologize for our viewers. Um, Please uh, send a note in chat if everything is good. So let's start our stream. We have about 90,000 people watching us. Over 24,000 of you click the like button. As usual, sorry for technical matters. Different things happen here when we cast. And uh, do not forget to subscribe to Fagin Live, to Alex Aristovich, and to the Privateer Station if you are listening or watching that in English language. Okay, let's uh, start. Maybe the map? Yeah, we brought up the map. Um, okay. No major changes on it. On any of the front lines. Same attempts to attack with uh, human waves on the east. From the new things, there are explosions happening now in Dnieper and Zaporozhye. And out of uh, some achievements, I think that's it. We didn't, by the way, mention it yesterday, but our guys have shot down a K-52 battle attack helicopter with a code si call sign beard, uh, two Russian pilots apparently very awarded, uh, so they're gone. Um, also, our border guards shot down a Su-34, a frontline bomber. You know, our border guards are still fighting. Actually, that's uh, pretty amazing what they do. No major changes on the Eastern Front as well. Their main effort is to surround Avdiivka and surround Bakhmut. They will not succeed. And uh, 
Today, Zelensky visited Slavyansk and congratulated our troops from there with the Day of Ukrainian Military. And the usual, he came to some of the hottest part of the front line to support our fighters. So, talking about Bakhmut, uh, that front line, is it uh, changing, is it evolving? Because that attempt to surround Bakhmut from Solidar, from Krasnagara, uh, Bakhmut is at the very top of that map that you see, the set of four arrows next to it. Do you think that can strain the front more uh, with their attempts to surround? Well, yeah, they can continue doing that, and it's another trap for them. We hope they do waste the last of the infantry they have, or whatever they accumulated. Equipment, personnel. One of the tasks of defense is to create conditions for the future offensive, because it doesn't make sense to conduct offensive operations against an enemy who still is very strong. Um, so we're achieving our goals and waiting and uh, grinding them down. Okay, so talking about mobilized, is there more mobilized, less mobilized on that side? In 24 hours we don't see them increasing. A day is a very short time span to have dramatic changes that could be discussed, such as uh, transfers of big numbers of troops. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes, uh, if you remember Kherson, Kharkov, Kiev, Sumy. But the last 24 hours were not like that. It's just the continuation of the same tendencies and trends that were in the front. Useless uh, attacks near Bakhmut, Avdiivka, Marinka. And we are destroying them. Just as fine. All right, so if that's it on the map, let's go through the news. Let's talk about Zelensky, who came to the front line to meet the soldiers. So what uh, was the highlight of his visit? You're saying that he made a statement that Bakhmut will not be given up, the defense is uh, stable. Do I understand it correct? No, no, no. I do not remember him saying in that words. Um, he did congratulate our troops with a professional holiday. As for Bakhmut being given, uh, I don't think President is discussing these publicly. Uh, no, no, I, I exaggerated a little bit. Uh, sorry, Alexei. Right. So, also, it is military decision to take Bakhmut, give Bakhmut, uh, change front line. This is not a presidential decision. This is the heads of the military and heads of the general command de decision. And, uh, you know, they've been talking about Putin's visit too, right? Yeah, they did. And uh, funny, they talked about Putin, but Zelensky is the one who came. And the more they talk about Zelensky's visit, the more reasons for Putin will be to try to do something uh, for the grandpa. I actually call him grandma. Um, by the way, Kursk, uh, were you there blowing things up again? Oh, no, no, no. They're just smoking in the wrong places again. Um, what? So what did they smoke up? They smoked up uh, an oil refinery. And that's not a small thing. That's a pretty serious element. I think it's the third one to practically irreparable. Uh, previously hit, and this is the third one. Um, and if you have no fuel, you can't really fight. So they had another security council. I don't know what they were doing in Russia at that council. I don't know if they were screaming or yelling or pulling hairs out, because all these uh, smoking accidents, they do happen pretty far deep into Russian territory. And uh, even the United States mentioned that, you know, we did not uh, supply anything for attacks on Russian territory. But I think the trend is visible that earlier they were smoking next to the border and now they start to smoke way deeper. I think uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich Hulo figured out that uh, it's time to be afraid because uh, 770 miles, uh, kilometers, 
is uh, way further than even Kremlin from that border. So he's probably getting scared a bit. So I'm getting a note here that uh, it was the fuel dump near the Kursk airport where strategic bombers are based from and some of the Russian aviation that continues attacks on Ukraine. We understand they will be upset at the higher levels of leadership in Russia and you cannot, you're just making a statement, you cannot uh, blatantly continue killing civilians and uh, destroying neighbors. And one thing is when you sit in Kremlin and think about the futures of the world and your geopolitical situations, and the other thing is when you realize that something may fly in your window. And then perhaps one will start thinking that history is a bit more complex process than uh, you thought before. When you were moving pawns and chess figures on the board in your mind, uh, thinking about restoration of uh, something USSR-like. Usually it uh, dawns on the one when he realizes that his guards are not for prestige only, they're actually for defense. And then they start looking at the guards and thinking, well, will they, will they be good enough to carry that duty? And then how much can they defend against the missile? It appears that Russia is not really protected right now and that all Russian potential can be blown to smithereens in a few hours. Yeah, it would be nice if the Western press would also talk not just about the possibility of uh, Russia getting uh, blown, blown up, Russian military potential, uh, but also about increasing Ukraine potential. That would be nicer. Um, speaking of Russian potential, their air defense haven't worked anywhere in those attacks. So, they, was it off? Was it not working? No, it just didn't work. I don't know why, I don't know the details, but they failed to discover. So, they, sh they missed? What, what happened? No, 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 they didn't even shoot. They failed to discover our um, smoking incident precursors. Uh, there were no shots fired at them, so... As I suspected, uh, as I suspected, like, see, that's all BS. All their big uh, military, that's just a BS. Well, but they do have guards, and they do have uh, symbols, and they do have a special church built for the military. <laughs> you, you just don't know, Mark, how to build these things. They built a cathedral or a church uh, at the cost of Martian colony, probably. And uh, maybe that's their strategic defense. Maybe they use uh, churches to do that. Well, then they should put way, way more of them around the strategic bombers' uh, airfields. Then maybe they will generate some field, some protection against it. So, yeah, I think that's, that's why they're kind of getting scared. I think uh, he is literally starting to be nervous because he realizes that uh, one of these hands may grab him by the balls and uh, he's uh, starting to have issues. I saw in your mm, tweets you mentioned that there were three planes destroyed. No, 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 there were a total of four. Three in Angels, one in Dagilev. Dagilev picture we've showed yesterday. I don't know if they'll rebuild that because that was a big damage. They are not making those engines anymore. They're not making some of the wing components anymore. And in Engels uh, 3, those are yeah completely destroyed. So, minus 4 altogether. That's uh, good news. Okay, Aristovich again destroying Russian potential. By the way, not too many people know that Engels is the city founded by Ukrainian Chumaks. U Ukrainian uh, merchants, uh, Chumaks, who were selling salt back in the 18th century, they founded that city. So, historically, that's a Ukrainian town. Are you going to take that too? Well, we'll see about that. But uh, the founding fathers were from Ukraine. So, Engels still has some churches founded by those guys. Interesting. Um, there was another news that uh, millions of help to Ukraine for next year are being blocked by Hungary. And Hungarian Foreign Affairs Minister 
says they do not uh, confirm that this was Hungary's fault at blocking that money. But uh, do you think, how do you comment that Hungary continues to pressure Ukraine being the only ally of Moscow within the EU? Or, or Moscow continues pressing to press Hungary as the only ally in Europe and Hungary in return continues pressing Ukraine. I think this is an unfriendly act that they're trying to hide behind the primitive we are for peace rhetoric. If you are for peace, call upon Putin to withdraw troops to start paying reparations. But uh, you're not giving Ukraine instead uh, any help where kids are and civilians are getting murdered just right now as we talk. And uh, they are not strong enough to call upon Putin, but they're strong enough to try to preclude the uh, EU from supporting Ukraine. And they've been yeah, posing for a while. They did not join the oil embargo. And I would say it's not Hungary itself, it's Orban and his party. It appears to me that it's a very primitive, uh, naive uh, rhetoric for which they have to apologize and explain right after they've uh, mumbled something. If you are for peace, well, stop the aggressor. Don't grab the hands of the one defending. Grab the hands and hold the hands of the aggressor. The fact that we need to try to explain that uh, two wise uh, Hungarian leaders from the Jobbik uh, party, no, Fides is the more moderate. Okay, so both, yeah, Fides and Jobbik. Okay, an important statement, uh, Vice of uh, Secretary of State, uh, and she made a statement, uh, she was the one meeting with Rybkov, the second phase uh, in the, the Foreign Ministry of Russia. Um, and she made a statement that the U.S. has enough, enough effort, uh, enough uh, supplies to support the new Ukraine and uh, will continue supporting Ukraine. And uh, Russia needs to withdraw troops. And we understand that uh, many things are surrounding this possible negotiations, but Russia has to withdraw troops before that commences. And uh, she did state that Putin will use any pause in order to reignite his effort in Ukraine. So the sum of that, she's uh, continuing to push Biden's statement uh, after uh, when they recently spoke with Macron during President's visit, uh, France President's visit to Washington, um, where they stated that there'll be no negotiations with Putin in the current format. Do you think by the end of the year, we're not gonna see the revival of that topic? Um, one should not worry about negotiations. Everything will be solved on the front line. And it's good to see that the West finally, after eight years of uh, Russian-Ukrainian war, is only negotiations are only making things worse. Minsk one and two were just uh, respites for the Russian military machine to continue their effort later. So I think even on the West, they start to realize that it's uh, silly to continue with the same and uh, that's what they're voicing okay so another question the land is getting the uh, earth is getting uh, colder zaporozhye and other places do you think there is a perspective for some counteroffensive or some more action on the front on some directions we don't know where weather conditions let's touch upon that are they going to be a defining factor Mark, next week we'll have about fi plus 50 Fahrenheit, plus 9 Celsius. So the question is, what will be with the soil? I'll try to say delicately here, offensive maneuvers of uh, military of defense uh, and any military maneuvers are not in direct proportion in direct relation with weather. If you really need one, you can do offensive under any conditions. 
Plus, there are different kinds of offensive. Like there is uh, artillery offensive. There is uh, an option to attack using air force. So yeah, now we're just asking some questions and probing if any opportunities for that. Well, we'll see when things unfold. I predict that there'll be at least five more successful operations uh, before Russia completely flees from our territory. Uh, it's um, probably not too productive to talk about the signs of possible offensive because the goal of uh, uncovering the possible offensive maneuver is one of the major goals of Putin's intel. So us doing that uh, would not be too productive. Okay, okay, we're not trying to help them, no. Um, so there is some... I was watching uh, some of the American press. There are some statements of... Uh, losing an interest uh, maybe it's not too dramatic but the western press is somewhat cooling down in relation to this matter to ukrainian to the war in ukraine um not so sure mark not so sure uh, from my point where i am it only is increasing the number of interviews i'm giving weekly maybe i'm living in a different uh, time continuum but there is uh, it's quite an increase recently and the last two months it was a little easier now there's definitely uh, an increase french american last week was definitely french and american uh, media reaching out so i do not quite feel that uh, declining trend in interest um, actually pretty big names in the journalism that i've seen so being curious to talk to us and uh, requesting the interviews so and again, it, it, it's cyclical, so once there'll be major changes on the front, there'll be another splash. And uh, this, is a, this is kind of an interest that is very often uh, something that can be formed by events and uh, things happening. Okay, we're almost at 100,000 likes. Um, please continue clicking that. And those who are watching us without subscription, please click subscribe button and click that bell so you get notifications about new publications. So, another piece of news, Igor Stilkov, uh, although he is Gherkin according to his last name on passport, but he likes his nick. So, he is making more statements and I was browsing his Telegram channel and actually posted some of that in my Telegram as well. Some people were even looking up where was he trying to go on the front? Which military detachment did he try to serve at? But in general, his analysis is, if to sum it up, nobody knows what the heck are they fighting for in the Russian trenches. Well, that's an obvious thing, right, Mark? We've talked about that 500 times already. Well, yeah, one thing, that's us, we're their enemies. Uh, those who hate Russians uh, or Jews, yeah. Yeah, right, Mark is... Uh, the one fearing Russians and Bandera uh, supporter and uh, Alexei, you would be in today's role play, you'll be a Jew. <laughs> okay, um, so what are we fighting for? What uh, we did mention that definition of goals, the intentions of war, they're important in order to define what are they fighting for. And they allow Kremlin to highlight what did they fight for, what did they achieve, and can they conclude the operation, do they have to continue. But in his interpretation, it's an interesting fact that uh, he doesn't see a cohesive understanding on, among Russian troops. And I think he is a somewhat public figure, so people were talking to him and he did uh, converse with a lot of them on the Russian front line. So, what do you think? Is it uh, by design? Are they saving some of the freedom of maneuver by fogging down their goals so that you cannot really tell what exactly they're fighting for? Well, I think that uh, it's a part. It's a part of it, but problem with goals is that the goals need to be achievable. If you have achievable goal, your troops will be fighting way better because they see objectives, they know that they can, and they are pretty clear about what to do in this regard. Right now, without the, the clear setting of the goals, they don't know. They're fighting poorly and they cannot achieve any goal, right? 
that infernal spiraling will preclude them from indeed achieving any goals. And then they can backpedal and say, well, this was our strategic ideation to not set exact goals and we didn't want to achieve that, we actually achieved the other things. That will not quite fly. What's that Russian proverb giving the need for... What do you give the need for? Oh, yeah, yeah. to give the need for charity, right. Okay. So, in any case, we'll continue observing that. Oh, by the way, mopeds are flying in Zaporozhye right now. Yep, right now, as we're talking, they're being shot down. Do you guys have enough means and measures to counter that? Yeah, we do. So, time has passed and mopeds are much less of a threat. Yes. Have you seen a video where a jeopard on our front shot down a cruise missile? I've seen some. Uh, there was a, a soldier shooting from, um, from a rifle at... Uh, yeah, no, uh, and uh, at the end, cruise missile was shot down by Jeopard, and that was on the video. So the question is, what is Jeopard doing on the flight route of cruise missile? How? Next question is, how did it end up being there when the missile is flying? Well, how, how, how did it come about? Why did you put it there? Well, probably we understand something about the routes of uh, their missiles and the routes of their attacks, right? And how is Jeopard about uh, mopeds, uh, Iranian drones, UAVs? Oh, that's uh, peanuts for it. It's real easy. If it hits cruise missiles, all that uh, couple hundred miles an hour flying slow motion thingies, that's nothing for it. Okay, let's take a look at uh, mobilization and Peskov's uh, answer, Putin's spokesperson answering to these questions. He said there are a lot of provocative messages in the media. One should be looking at the information published by Minister of Defense and the President, and uh, he does not see perspectives for negotiations with Ukraine in the context of current uh, situation on the front. And information is coming through indeed that mobilization continues uh, in uh, remote regions where people were not protesting against it, so they continue plucking people from there, some of them just getting notified, but the others are getting sent to the front. We also saw that Ukrainian military intel from time to time saying that Russia is preparing another next big mobilization wave. Those who failed to flee, to leave the country. Do you have any thoughts about that? Mobilization indeed has not stopped. And transition to a new wave of mobilization, we are expecting might happen in January, February, when the current wave of mobilized will be done with. And they do understand that physically they are running out of the current personnel, the current uh, mobilized and uh, cadre, and uh, they do need to replace them with new. So they are planning. That's the plans of your command, dear mobilized, dear future mobilized. They already write you off by hundreds of thousands. Because a uh, problem with mobilized, you can only use them in very limited number of activities. And uh, the practice, we can see near Bakhmut, that they run out of about a battalion per day, about 600 people per day. 10 days, 6,000. 100 days, 60,000. These are just killed. And they're also wounded, right? So 60 in 100 days turns into 120,000. And then they're asking for another 120,000 people on the front, knowing in advance that they'll be written off as well. After which, Russian mobilized men, people of great character and IQ, follow in droves after their Fuhrer to the graves.
And uh, in my understanding, they're not really protesting that. For us, generally, that wave of uh, mobilization will only mean that there'll be more partisans and more protests within Russia. Did you hear, by the way, what happened in the Far East? There was, on the Trans-Siberian Railroad, near Krasnoyarsk, that's more towards Siberia, unknown people destroyed some equipment without which a uh, railroad cannot be used, so now they have to fix that. And uh, that stops the trains from throwing more people to the war and transporting them, because a lot of uh, Wagner resupplies, re fitting a new personnel for that uh, private company is coming from the Far East. So you think it's the Legion of Free Russia? Yeah, it's uh, Russian cells of that group. And I think when it comes to mobilization, some people understand that where it will lead them, it will not be anything good in their future if they continue with it, if they decide to join the effort, and some people leave the country. Others vote against it by active, taking active measures. And I think what we see in the destruction of the railroad is uh, one of those active measures. Okay. Uh, today we also want to address that there are some screams at Moscow media that they published that according to Ukrainian attacks on the marketplace in Donetsk, there are some people who died, including some deputies uh, of the local council. Are they saying that Ukrainians are attacking marketplace? Well, they're writing, you have to comment that, right? Well, they've been writing that we've been uh, killing little boys and nailing them to billboards. So they keep writing all kind of crap about us. Um, no, we do not attack civilian targets. We normally, actually, Mark, it's, it's plain simple. You do not have enough uh, ammo to attack all the military targets. Why would you attack civilian targets? I can maybe think, okay, maybe it uh, veered off course, but the problem is that we do not shoot into the middle of the town. And uh, I'm sure there'll be documents coming up as to where the explosions were coming from, where the launch uh, happened. And it's hard to hide it from the locals. Locals heard where the missile came from, where the strike came from. So that will be surfacing up. It's not about us. And even if there would be some maniacs who would want to support uh, that theory and indeed shoot the market, we would find them and would prosecute them. But I'm thinking if they're losing some deputies and district attorney for the local uh, so-called republic, I'm thinking maybe they got rid of them themselves and then shot something at it to hide. By the way, we actually have some people from Donetsk listening to us and they're sending me text messages here in the chat saying that they heard shots coming from Makeevka. The shot came, Makeevka is uh, deeper into the territory, into the Russian occupied territory. So yeah, it's not Ukrainian troops shooting. We already saw these incident instances before when they had a ghost truck with a mortar set in a uh, truck bed shelling their town as if Ukrainians are doing it. So, yeah. Don't, uh, Moscow shouldn't be presenting their execution of our Ukrainian citizens in the occupied territories as attacks by Ukraine. Well, we have to discuss that, right? Of course, we have to address that and uh, comment that uh, they are presenting it in uh, a very untrue light. Okay, Shoigu, Russian Minister of Defense, came out and made a statement today that Russian military continue to liberate Donbass. And over the last uh, few days, they captured Opetna, Pavlovka, Belogorovka, Yuzhna, and Kordumovka. You remember, they also mentioned that they got Leman. They got Kherson, they got many other, they, got, they had Kupensk under their control. Where is that now? So can you support, can you affirm that 
All these towns, including Kordyumovka, are indeed under control of Moscow. There are no towns, there are settlements, and some of them indeed are taken by Russian troops. But Mark, this is a small soldier play, so game of soldiers. This is not serious rhetoric. The country that pretends to be a superpower of the world, a nuclear uh, arsenal rich country, is talking about grabbing little settlements on the front line. You'd probably fail to get acknowledgement from me, even if you torture me, that you've taken a little settlement on the front line on the 10th month of war while cosplaying, you know, uh, their grandfathers who took Berlin back in the Second World War. There is another thing too. I, one would think that maybe they could use the pause or whatever, the military pause and operational pause to take the bodies out from the front lines. I'm getting messages actually right now that uh, it stinks because of the amount of dead bodies. It's really difficult to fight there. They're disintegrating uh, the dead bodies, those layers upon layers that they send out to storm. And uh, yeah, the stench is horrible. So that's all, that's all their achievement. They just buried a ton of fathers, brothers, husbands on the line, and they're not taking them back yet. Uh, today, Denis Pushilin mentioned that there was an exchange 50 on 50, uh, or later corrected 60 on 60. Denis Pushilin, yeah, I call him Penis Dushilin, but uh, yeah, he indeed, uh, Alexei, he did an, an indeed uh, exchange some, and I understand among them are the fighters who were defending Azov Steel. You can support that, right? Um, yeah, I'm verifying it from the sources that I see. Uh, preliminary, it is confirmed, uh, but it needs to be officially confirmed as well. Yeah, people are sending us messages as we talk here. Okay, another interesting news. We're trying to take the ones that have some significance. So the head of Ukrainian military intel, Budanov, is saying that Russia has enough high-precision missiles for a few more mass uh, attacks. So Reuters published that. What does he mean a few? Is it two, four, six? Well, Mark, they have about 200 missiles left of Ha-55, Ha-101. If you put anywhere between 40, 70 or 100 missiles per hit, so if you put 100 into a strike, then it's only two strikes. If you do 40 or 50, you can extend it for four or five barrages. But I think very soon they'll run out, indeed. For the ones that they had initially launched, 100 missiles each, uh, they maybe can do it three times, maybe four times more. If they add more nomenclature to it, it's a sad story. They, I'll, I'll try to calculate here. They wasted so much resources on that. I think it's about totaling at $10 billion in uh, missiles hardware that they wasted on barely even tactical targets. And what did they achieve? Ukraine spent two days without electricity and you do not have strategic potential. It's Cruise missile is a strategic resource. It's not operative resource. They can change the resource uh, they're using on us. They can use uh, X or HA-22, which doesn't have an exactitude uh, of the better missiles. This one has plus minus 600 yards. But you understand, right? Then if you use that, that's about nothing. Even with the current missiles, they fail to hit a lot of targets. But then if the dispersal uh, or error rate is 600 yards, yeah, that's just the general shooting in the vicinity of. Then there is also another group of missiles that uh, fly not too far, that has maybe 300 miles radius. 
and they'll likely be swapping effective ones for lesser vehicles. And um, some of them are missile, like uh, H-55, they're anti-ship missiles, but they can fly over land and they can hit land targets as well. But there, uh, in the future, I see the effectiveness of these strikes really going down. Overall, remember we talked at the beginning, uh, we to talked about that at the first day when they started. This is our problem, Mark. We sometimes say smart things way further before the eventuality unfolds. We need to repeat them later, kind of come back and say, hey, we told you so. Yesterday, by the way, it's not just our military, but also air defense systems and energy networks worked real well because they took certain measures that they learned from previous uh, missile attacks and uh, they took into consideration other things we had. And yeah, yesterday missile strike didn't even lead to any lights going out. So this is EDSC on their side. This is worse than burning dollars to hit the house. It's essentially wasting your strategic potential for nothing. You have to be a Kremlin strategist to do that. You have to be Putin's military officer to plan the war like that. I'll make one remark here. There is a consideration we use, the calculation of numbers and how much money they spent. But that's not how it works there. They don't care about money that much. We've dumped, we've dumped, that's what they think. The main they care about is the result. If they stop achieving any result, then it will be the matter not even of money, but more of a, hey, you promised us, Suravikin, you promised us that you will build Suravikin line, that you'll hold the defense and you'll achieve, uh, you'll freeze Ukrainians this winter, so they'll be begging for peace, but you failed to do that. So why the F have you failed to do that? We gave you resources and you failed to. So how about answering for that? And by the way, yeah, you also lost the strategic bombers. Well, there is a nuance here, Mark. They talk a lot about the failures of Russian military, failures of Russian special services. I'll pose a question here. Who was judging the data they provided and who was making political decisions? Wouldn't it be the top military commander of Russian Federation? Military cannot make a decision to start war. They cannot make a decision to use strategic resource without information from the main leader. They cannot violate articles of constitutions and international law without the command of main leader. So all this pointing at military, it's uh, smoke and mirrors. It's uh, literally their Fuhrer who is taking these decisions and is pushing the responsibility onto the shoulders of others. He's the one who wasted their strategic resources. He's the one who authorizes these useless attacks. They're idiots. If somebody after the war will manage to press the right buttons and I will fret and start saying a little more than I should, I might even mention how these missiles could have been used in order to really cause trouble for us. But uh, they don't have enough brains. And um, yeah, they just wasted them pointlessly. Wasting half a billion dollars for each volley, that's ridiculous. And they don't have enough means to rebuild that potential. And remember, these idiots are going to fight NATO. They cannot win over Ukrainian power lines and power stations. And they're going to fight with NATO. And wasted every potential they had to fight with NATO if, if they want to, onto Ukrainian air defense systems, which shot most of it down. You know, the, the hardest time was after the strike before the last, where in some parts in Ukraine from three to five days we did not have electricity. And that was the cost of their strategic missile stash, so that Ukrainians would not charge their power banks and not wash their clothes for a few days. We did wash them later, and they charge everything, and we have light again. I, if I imagine myself to be at the head of Russian Federation, 
after seeing results, maybe first volley, second volley, and you understand that you cannot replenish these missiles easily, you realize that after the second volley, this is a crime against Russian national security to be using these uh, resources, but they, they don't care, they keep shooting. Well, okay, let them, let them waste it. It will be much easier to wrap it up when time comes. Okay, at the end of the stream, I want to say I don't want to bring it up as a question. There's so much uh, shit being thrown about this topic. Today, in Latvia, they made a decision about uh, revoking the license of a TV channel reign. And there is a ton of hate, a ton of uh, mutual conversations, accusations. I think they're pointless. Those people who read my Telegram channel, I mentioned it there. TV Rain is still in the media. They're still on YouTube, just like we are. I don't understand why people are screaming. YouTube is open for them to cast. Mark, TV Rain has on one of their intro reels Crimea as a part of Russian Federation. Well, Alexei, yeah, they can, as I said, to each their own. They, they can still continue uh, their streams. There is a lot of discussion going that everything is done. TV Rain is done for, they're not in the cable news. Uh, yeah, they are not. They're withdrawn from some of the networks. They'll probably not be getting grants or money from the advertising there, but they're on YouTube. They're just like you and me, and I think it's over-dramatizing of that move. You know, and all these networks with the current modern technology, yeah, it's good that they exist, but nobody really, you can survive without it. Not a big deal. That's what I'm saying. They have a YouTube channel, they have YouTube representation, so they're not out. Uh, we are here on YouTube, we're doing our things. We don't really work with them. We don't intersect with them in any capacity, usually. Maybe there is an audience that was watching that on TV. Um, our audience are probably watching it on YouTube. And me personally, I don't even watch them at all. But um, anyway, Alexei, thank you for coming. We've been about 45, 46 minutes live. 361,000 watched us, watched the stream. 100 and plus thousand click the like button. Please continue sharing and posting links to that and subscribing to Fagin Live to Alexei Rostovich. And you watch that, uh, if you watch that in English, please subscribe to the privateer station. Tomorrow is Wednesday. Are we good tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow is good. Okay, so we'll pick things up tomorrow. Um, although there may be the schedule is pretty difficult after lunch, so I will stay in touch with you, Mark. Okay. Goodbye, dear friends. We'll see you soon. Thank you and uh, happy holiday.